Hello, I'm John Ward on behalf of Anglo Far East and Physical Gold Fund. We're delighted to have with us here Jim Ricketts. Mr. Ricketts is the author of the New York Times bestseller, Currency Wars, The Making of the Next Global Crisis. He's an investment banker and investment advisor based in New York, and he also serves on the Investment Advisory Committee for the Physical Gold Fund. Welcome, Jim, and thank you for joining us. Thank you, John. Glad to be with you. Jim, can we begin with the tapering story? At the time we're recording this interview, view, we're coming up to another Fed meeting and presumably another announcement about their massive asset buying program. Now, without trying to second guess that announcement, could you look ahead to 2014 and reflect for us on the Fed's likely posture overall? What are their options and what are the consequences of those options? Well, it's a very good question, John. The Fed will be tapering throughout 2014. The exact date that that begins is less important than the fact that it's going to begin and it's going to continue throughout the year. And they're currently purchasing about $85 billion per month, a so-called long-term asset purchases. And if the taper uh, taper tempo, if you will, is about $10 billion a month, and over the course of nine months, uh, let's say roughly uh, March to November, they would have reduced it to zero, and that would be the end of QE3. Although it's a curious thing, the QE3, when it was announced, there was never a time period put on it, and there was never a total quantity put on it. You know, you go all the way back to QE2, and which was uh, leaked in August 2010 and formally commenced in November 2010. Uh, the Fed said specifically that they were going to buy uh, $600 billion of intermediate term securities uh, prior to the end of June. And they did so. But the problem with that is they boxed themselves in. The market immediately discounted the impact of that. And then by March of 2011, as we were getting close to the end of QE2, the market was getting nervous. The stock market was going down and, and the market was in effect saying to the Fed, well, that was fun. What else have you got for us? In other words, the Fed painted themselves in a the corner. When they announced QE3 in September of 2012, they were careful not not to paint themselves into a corner. They said, well, we're going to do this, but we're going to tell you how much we're buying monthly, but we're not going to put a total on it. We're not going to put a time period on it. Now, we are going to commence tapering, and that is going to reduce these long-term asset purchases, but the Fed has said all along they could increase them. So you could see a world where they start to taper, and maybe by uh, the middle of 2014, by the way, I expect we may well be in a recession in 2014, the Fed may have to reverse course uh, and actually increase long-term asset purchases, or they may keep reducing them to, in effect, get to 100% taper, or they may level them off. They may reduce them for $10 billion a month for several months on their way to zero, but then say, you know, we're going to level them off. We're not going to reduce them this month and this month. Now, I realize I'm laying out a lot of possibilities. I am saying they will start tapering, but and I, my expectation is that they will, will taper to zero over the course of 2014, but I've laid out two other possibilities. One is that they could begin to taper and call a halt and just keep buying a certain amount, maybe it's $40 billion or $50 billion, until further notice, or in a more extreme case, if the economy goes into a recession, they could actually increase long-term asset purchases. Now, if that sounds confusing to the listener, welcome to the world of Fed manipulation, because it's confusing to the Fed. I I think the important thing for our listeners, John, is they should understand the Fed actually does not know what they're doing. There's all this confidence reposed in the Fed in the sense that uh, it'll all be good and the Fed's engineering a uh, you know, smooth recovery. Uh, that Nothing could be further from the truth. This is a massive experiment. Uh, nothing like this has ever been done before in major central bank monetary policy. The Fed can speculate on the impact, but they don't really know. We are all, as investors, uh, we're all guinea pigs in, in their experiment. So, again, expectationally, uh, they'll start to taper and see it through before the end of 2014, but we don't really know. It, they, the Fed has taken pains to say it's data dependent, and the data come in weaker. If we get into a recession, unemployment goes up, inflation turns into deflation, then the Fed may very well increase asset purchases. So, I think investors, what they need to do is prepare for a world where any of those things are possible, rather than put a stake in the ground of around one course of action and position accordingly, you need to think of it almost like a quantum cloud of possible outcomes that are contingent or conditional and be prepared for any of them. What, what is it that gives you reason to believe they will taper even down to zero? Is it that the underlying economy is in fact that much stronger and can support that decision? Or is it just that they've sort of talked themselves into that position and have to live up to it? It's a little more the latter with some other concerns that they're not speaking about. My view is that 
the economy is fundamentally weak. Do not buy into the story that, you know, the recent uh, improvement in the employment market and improved GT- GDP data, I mean, that is what it is. That data is out there and there's no denying it. But I don't view any of that as sustainable. Of course, third quarter GDP was quite strong, but most of it was inventory accumulation. If you think the economy is going to get a lot stronger, there might be more inventory accumulation. But that appears to have been an anomaly and you would actually not repeat it and inventories w- would be drawn down in the fourth quarter, which would reduce GDP. So that's one factor. Uh, also, there were some, uh, you know, the third quarter ended, of course, on September 30th, and that was the exact date when the U.S. government began a new fiscal year and the uh, sequester fears and continuing resolution fears and uh, debt ceiling fears and government shutdown, all that was at its height. And there was a lot of uh, jockeying around September 30th. It was an acceleration of government purchases because the agencies thought they might not have the money after October 1st, which turned out to be true, and so forth. And so for all those reasons, I don't put much stock in the third quarter GDP data. Employment, um, yeah, the, the unemployment rate is coming down, but of course we all know it's for the wrong reasons. Uh, it's coming down because labor force participation is declining. Did go up a little bit in the um, November report, but we'll see if that's sustainable. But for the course of the year, labor force participation was dropping sharply. So uh, we're getting a lower unemployment rate, but for the wrong reason. And and that labor force participation actually bespeaks a weaker economy. When you look at other data, 50 million Americans on food stamps, uh, 26 million Americans unemployed or underemployed, uh, 11 million Americans and rising on disability, which is really just a new form of unemployment because the you know the barriers to claiming disability are quite low. Uh, after two years on disability, you qualify for Medicare regardless of age. And so we're seeing people in their 40s getting Medicare, which is normally reserved for those uh, 65 or older. Some new tax increases coming out of the Ryan deal. Uh, There's just a large amount of data that says uh, the economy is really fundamentally weak. And indeed, I do expect a recession in, in 2014. So with all that said, you would not expect tapering. And I think Janet Yellen's models tell her don't taper. But they have another problem, which is the balance sheet is now blown past four trillion. The the Fed balance sheet, uh the, the base money or what's called M zero was in two thousand eight it was about eight hundred billion. Today that number is uh as we speak passing four trillion and it's going up at the rate of a trillion dollars a year. So what do you do? I mean do you just take the balance sheet to five trillion, six trillion? Legally this is possible, but uh there comes a time when you might actually cause a loss of confidence in the Fed itself. So the Fed is really between a rock and a hard place. They uh their models tell them not to taper, but politics, common sense and fears of cross causing a loss of confidence in the dollar itself and the Fed itself, tell them that they should taper in order not to destroy their balance sheet. So not an enviable, enviable position, but they it's sort of uh, their just desserts. They painted themselves into this corner by starting the program in the first place. I do think it's important to bear in mind that if you could go back in a time machine to 2009 when QE2 was really in the works and say to the Fed, here's where you're going to be in 2014. You'll have a weak recovery, almost no inflation, and a $4 trillion balance sheet. How do you feel? My view is the Fed never would have started this. They never expected to be here. They thought that the cutoff gets so-called escape velocity or self-sustaining real growth by 2010, maybe 2011. It never happened. So here we are, and they have to deal with it. But I, as I say, I do expect them to taper, but they'll be tapering into weakness, probably aggravate a, a looming recession anyway, and have to do something else just to keep the whole game going. Well, let me pick up on the last point you made, and maybe you can clarify something for me. As I understand it, the Fed has been committed to maintaining nominal growth in the GDP, as it were paper growth by printing money on the assumption that sooner or later truth will catch up with fiction and give us real economic growth. Is that a correct portrait of the strategy overall? And if it is, what's your assessment of that strategy? Well, it's a correct understanding of what they're trying to do. Uh, The problem is it's not working. An ideal universe for the Fed would be, of course, high real growth and low inflation. That's their Fed nirvana. They're nowhere close to that. But what they're saying instead is, okay, if we can't have high real growth with low inflation, we'll take high nominal growth with higher inflation if that's what it takes. And the reason for that is they've got to get the nominal growth because the debt is nominal. I'm a big advocate of uh, thinking of things in real terms. Basically, real just means you take the nominal number and you subtract inflation and that gets you to a real number. So whether it's GDP growth or interest rates or other metrics, take out the inflation to get to the real number. The problem is with debt-to-GDP ratios and debt itself, that's not a real phenomenon. That's a nominal phenomenon. If I borrow a dollar from you, I owe you a dollar. Now, it's sort of interesting if in real terms it's worth a dollar five or maybe 95 cents. It could be worth more or less, depending on whether we have inflation or deflation. But that is irrelevant for purposes of the contract. Contractually, I owe you a dollar. Well, the United States owes the world 
$17 trillion. And in order to pay that off, we're going to need nominal growth. So would the Fed like real growth? Yes, they would. But will they accept nominal growth uh, with a big inflation component in lieu of that? Yes, they will, if that's, if that's the best they can get, because they have to do that to keep the nominal debt-to-GDP ratio getting higher. Now, here's the problem. The problem is they're not getting it. They're not getting the inflation. So we don't have enough real growth or inflation to drive nominal growth to keep a lid on the debt-to-GDP ratio. You know, there's a lot of self-congratulations in Washington right now over the fact that our deficit has come down, which it has. Over two years, the deficit has come down from about $1.4 trillion to something closer to $800 billion. That's a huge drop. And, uh, you know, it's good as far as it goes. But, and here's the point, the debt-to-GDP ratio is still going up because even though the deficit came down from 1.4 trillion to 800 billion it's still 800 billion you still piled 800 billion into the numerator uh, of that fraction meanwhile the denominator is not growing fast enough the denominator being nominal gdp growth that's not growing fast enough to maintain a stable or declining ratio and so we live in this funny world where deficits are coming down but debt to GDP is still going up. We're still on the on the road to being Greece because we're not getting enough nominal growth. The Fed would like it, but they're not getting it. So this is really the, the bigger picture, if you will. We understand what the Fed wants. We understand what they're doing to try to get it, but it's just not working. So that's a, that's a pretty scary picture. Well, speaking of nominal and real, could you explain briefly the difference between nominal and real interest rates, a distinction I hear about from time to time, and particularly what are the implications for the price of gold? Well, the difference between the nominal rate and the real rate is, is fairly straightforward. The difference is inflation. So you take a nominal rate, and uh, which is just, that's the rate you actually see on the screen. So how much, the, what's the coupon on the 10-year note? And then you adjust that for price movements, uh, you know, because it could, you know, can trade a premium or a discount, and that affects what's called the yield to maturity. But, you know, the yield to maturity is what you get when you buy it and you hold it. So you're the owner of that note. The yield to maturity is what you get. So that's your nominal yield. And they bounce around, but right now nominal yields on, on a 10-year note, let's say, are around 2.5%. They've been upwards of 3% uh, you know, last summer, and, and they've been lower last year. But let's just take that kind of 2.5%. That's the nominal yield. Now, what you have to do is subtract inflation to get the real yield. And inflation right now is about 1%. Again, it bounces around a little bit, but call it 1%. So with a 2.5% nominal yield minus 1% inflation, that gives you a 1.5% positive real yield. That's not a great environment for gold. It means that uh, people who hold the note, uh, even net of inflation, are making real money. What the Fed wants is the opposite of that. The Fed wants negative real rates. Now, how do you get negative real rates? Well, that's a world where inflation is higher than the nominal rate. So, for example, if the nominal rate was 2.5% and inflation was 3.5%, you would say, well, 25 minus 3.5 is negative 1. So, in that case, the real rate would be negative 1%. That's a very good environment for gold. Uh, it's a very powerful inducement to go out and borrow. You know, uh, it's one thing to, you know, normally we borrow money and we have to pay interest. Sometimes the rates are close to zero, so I can borrow money and pay practically zero just because the cost of funds is so low. I mean, a normal consumer or business can't do that, but the banks have been doing it for a long time uh, because they're paying their depositors uh, close to zero. So that's one thing, but with negative real rates when inflation is higher than uh, the nominal rate, that's even better than zero. That's the case where the bank is paying you to be a borrower. If I, in other words, if I borrow money at, let's say, 2.5%, but inflation is 3.5%, I get to pay the bank back in cheaper dollars. I mean, yes, I'm paying the 2.5% nominal interest, but the money is being devalued at 3.5%, so I pay you back in cheaper dollars. That's what we mean by a negative real interest rates. Now, the reason that's good for gold is because one of the wraps on gold is, of course, it has no yield. Now, I, not to digress too much, but I would say that gold shouldn't have a yield because gold is money. If you take a dollar bill out of your wallet and look at it, it doesn't have a yield. Now, you can put it in the bank or you can put it in the stock market or you can put it in the bond market. You can do a lot of things with it to get yield, but to do so, you're taking risk. In other words, there's no yield without risk. Uh, a dollar bill, actually cash, sitting in front of me, has no yield because, in theory, it has no risk. Same with gold. If I have a gold bar in front of me, you know, Warren Buffett would say, well, why would you own it? It has no yield. And I would say, well, that's fine because it has no risk. It has no maturity risk. It has no counterparty risk. It has no settlement risk if it's sitting in front of me, etc. So the fact that gold doesn't have a yield has never troubled me because I view it as money and therefore it's not supposed to have a yield. But most investors look at it differently. They're comparing it to stocks and bonds 
money markets and things that do have yield. And so if I say, well, there's no yield on my gold, but it costs me a certain amount of money to store it because I've got to pay storage, or if you're a leveraged investor, you're paying money on the borrowed money, and so it has a negative carry. That's a hurdle. You have to believe gold is going up in order to do that trade. But if in a world of negative real rates where the cost of borrowing money is actually negative for the reason I mentioned, then I actually get a positive return on gold. If I borrow money and buy gold and the cost of money is negative, I'm actually making a profit on my gold, even if gold doesn't go up. Of course, I expect it will go up, but that's a looking glass world. And so, so negative real rates, which is what we had in the 1970s, is very positive for gold. The Fed is trying to get there. The Fed is trying to get to negative real rates. The problem is, as I mentioned earlier, it's not working. Well, let's build out the picture here a little bit about the role of gold for the wise investor. When you survey this current financial situation, what is the place of gold in a well-managed portfolio? What's its function? What's its purpose? Well, there are a number of functions. I view it, you know, the simplest way to put it is I think of gold as money. So I say, if you like money or you want some money, you should have some gold. So that's a succinct way of putting it. But just to kind of expand on that a little bit, I personally like gold because it's robust to inflation or deflation. You know, so far in this conversation, John, we've talked about how the Fed is trying to get inflation, trying to get negative uh, interest rates, trying to get nominal GDP going. But I've said repeatedly, it's not working. Their policies are a failure. What does that mean? Well, what it means is that we might tip into the opposite world. We might tip into a world of deflation. And historically, gold has done well in both environments. In inflation, where inflation is higher than nominal rates and you get these negative real yields, or inflation runs away from the Fed. The Fed thinks they can control it, but they actually can't control it. Gold does very well. That's the that's the scenario that we saw in the 1970s. I expect that will happen again. Not right away, because it's going to take a while to get the inflation going, but once it does... Uh, my view is it will run away from the Fed. They won't be able to control it. So that inflationary environment is very good for gold. So gold does well in inflation. What's less understood is that gold can do very well in deflation. Not right away. Once the deflation kicks in in a small way, the real value of cash is going up. People want to hoard cash. They don't particularly like gold. In fact, the nominal uh, price of gold could even fall a little bit in that environment. But there comes a time when the deflation feeds on itself, when it gets out of control. And this is the Fed's worst nightmare. The Fed actually does doesn't fear inflation that much because they think they can control inflation. I think they're wrong about that, but they don't. They think they can control it. But they know that they cannot control deflation. Deflation feeds on itself. Hoarding cash pays a positive return because your cash is more valuable, increases bankruptcies, it puts stress on the banking system. If I make a certain amount of money and the price of everything I buy drops, I have an increase in my real standard of living. I pay less for you know gas and groceries and all the things I buy. But the government doesn't know how to tax that. They know how to tax a raise. If I make more money, they tax that in a heartbeat. But if I am better off because prices went down, they can't tax it. So for all these reasons, the reason we mentioned earlier about the impact on debt to GDP, deflation is a central bank's worst nightmare. It exacerbates the debt to GDP ratio. It destroys tax revenues. It destroys the banking system. It destroys everything that a central bank stands for. So what do you do? Well, the Fed, of course, for the last four years has been fending off deflation by printing money. But what if they fail? What if deflation gets the upper hand? There's always one way to guarantee inflation. If you printed money, use forward guidance, lowered interest rates, operation twists, nominal GDP targeting, currency wars, yeah, every trick in the Fed book, you did them all and they didn't work. There's always one way to destroy deflation, which is to increase the price of gold. Well, this is exactly what the United States did in 1933. Uh, it's exactly what the UK did in 1931 when they went off the gold standard. In other words, when you devalue your currency relative to gold, it works because a gold can't fight back. You know, if I try to devalue my currency relative to the euro, the euro can fight back by achieving their currency. That's what the currency wars are all about. But if I cheapen my currency relative to gold, which means increasing the dollar price of gold, it means that the government would actually have an interest in increasing the price of gold, not because they want to reward gold investors, but because because they want to cheapen the currency and cause inflation. That actually works because gold can't fight back, and that is what happened in the 1930s. So you have two paths. Uh, it's hard to know which one will prevail because the forces are very strong in both directions. But the nice thing about gold, it works in both states of the world. In inflation, the price of gold just goes up. That's what we saw in the 70s. In deflation, the price of gold also goes up, not by itself, but by government dictate. And that's what we saw in the 1930s. So I like gold because it helps me out in inflation and deflation. Well, Jim, you recently accompanied Philip Judge and Alex Stanzik on behalf of Physical Gold Fund on a visit to the fund's refinery in Switzerland, one of the world's largest processors of precious metals. What did you take away from that trip and the conversations you had there? Well, it was fascinating. 
first of all, uh, you know, Philip and uh, Alex were excellent traveling companions. We had a very pleasant sojourn in Switzerland. We were in uh, Zurich, outside of Zurich, a place called Klotten, which is where a lot of the vaults are. Then we traveled by train from Zurich to Lugano and went outside of Lugano to a place called Madrisio, which is where the refiners are. So we were sort of all over Switzerland, had a a great trip. And, you know, a lot of analysts, I like to say, some people need to get out more. You know, we include myself. We we tend to spend too much time in front of a computer screen or in front of a TV screen and looking at spreadsheets and looking at blogs and reading this and reading that. It's fine. You need to do deep dives from a research perspective, but you also need to get out, uh, kick the tires, as I say, visit the sites, talk to people. You'll learn an enormous amount that way, and that, that is indeed what happened on our, our visit. When we went to the vaults, th- these were ones uh, run by one of the world's leading secure logistics companies. That's where Physical Gold Fund is uh, actually, actually stores its gold. We were there to visit and meet with officials, but we were also there to uh, audit the gold. We were the two partners from uh, the fund's auditors, Ernst & Young, and they actually you know, bought the, bought the gold out on pallets and uh, on the forklift and took the top off the box and voila, there were the gold bars and all of the serial numbers and the dates and the refiner and the assayer and the weight and the auditors went down bar by bar so all present and accounted for. So that was just a really interesting process to watch. But of course of doing so, we got to study and learn about the vaulting system and uh, it is fascinating. There are little things almost out of a a, spy novel. For example, you you need sort of garage doors. At some point you have to bring armored cars into the vault. Well, how do you do that? Well, you need a bay and you need a large door and you think to yourself, well, you know, why couldn't I just take a battering ram and smash down that door and break into the vault? Well, of course, on the other side of that door is another door. You know, they lower the first door behind you, open the second door in front of you, you pull into a second bay, and then there are cement and steel reinforced barriers. So if you tried the battering ram technique, you wouldn't get very far. And the way they offload the gold from the truck is at a 90 degree angle, at a right angle. So any truck trying to kind of ram its way through would quickly hit a dead end. There's no way to pivot to a 90 degree turn with no runway, so to speak. And so just little things like that, you know, security cameras, motion detectors, you know, concertina wire, it's a form of very sharp barbed wire all over the place, and, you know, other detectors, uh, eyes and ears, armed guards, everything you would expect, and multiple security perimeters. So I just described two, you know, the first bay, the second bay. Well, actually, that's the third, that's three, because outside, of course, you have a high wall and, and concertina wire. But even at that point, you're only sort of getting into the vault. There are special portals, if you will, where I put it on one side, the steel door closes, someone takes out the other side, there's Kevlar, bulletproof glass, on and on and on, multiple security perimeters. So hard to imagine it being more secure, and of course, they're privately owned, they're Swiss, they're outside the banking system, and of course, being Swiss, they're outside the European monetary system. So they have, uh, of course, Swiss is a very secure, stable country. So, yeah, you can pick your spot. Some people prefer other locations, but for physical storage, large quantities of gold, I can't imagine a, a better place than the one that the Physical Gold Fund uh, has selected within Switzerland. Quite impressive. In addition to that, we met with the, the officials, and those are very revealing discussions. They, they told us they're seeing a steady inflow from bank storage to private storage. Now, in theory, the bank storage is just as good in the sense that the vaults are fine, but that's not the point. The point is banks are heavily regulated by governments, and the gold might be subject to seizure by governments, or at least it would be easier to seize or regulate or control or maybe prevent withdrawals if it were in the banking system. And, of course, the banks might fail, and your claim to gold might get tied up in some kind of court proceeding. Would you be bailed in, as happened in Cyprus, where you come in effect um, you know, credit of the bank and your assets are used to, you know, restore bank solvency. Maybe they're tied up for three years. Who knows, right? But the point is, in private storage, you don't have any of those issues. So uh, quite apart from um, from our fund putting its gold there, which I think is a, is a very sound choice, uh, they're seeing a lot of gold coming out of the banking system into the private system. And they're actually adding capacity. They almost can't build the vaults fast enough. So that was fascinating. We went down to one of the largest, largest refiners in Switzerland. The same thing there. Uh, got to view the operation from the inside. Had very constructive and, and quite lengthy conversations with senior officials there. And there also the story is uh, is fascinating, which is they're operating at maximum capacity. Uh, the, the refining process is heavily automated uh, at this stage. And they're working 24 hours a day, three shifts, 
uh, around the clock to meet demand. They can't meet all the demand. Uh, of course, most of it's coming from China. It's coming from numerous sources, not just China, that we should emphasize, but a lot of the gold that they're producing is going to China. China would like more, but they can't produce more, and uh, they have existing clients that they need to serve. They can't sort of walk away from existing clients, so reserving some of the gold for existing clients, giving all the rest to China, uh, even at that, China wants more. And this is one refinery we visit now. We visit it now, multiply that by multiple large refineries in Switzerland, eight refineries in China, other refineries around the world, Johnson, Matthew, Perth, Maine, et cetera. Uh, and you can begin to get some sense of the, the, uh, how much gold uh, China is actually taking in. So, again, and the other thing that was highly revealing, so you say the refinery is producing all this gold, where are they getting the gold to refine? Uh, in other words, where are the inputs coming from? Well, there, there are three main sources. One is semi-refined gold, so-called dore, which is about 90% gold uh, coming from the miners, so-called scrap, which is just, you know, jewelry, necklaces, bracelets, watches, and things coming from a variety of sources. And then the other are bars that are being converted into smaller bars. So these are so-called 400-ounce London Bullion Market Association good delivery bars uh, that are being turned into kilo bars to Chinese specifications. Now, two things there. Number one, so they're kind of melting down the 400-ounce the bars, but they're also refine, refining them. A 400-ounce bar can be sort of two nines plus, you know, 99.5 or 99.7 percent gold. That's not good enough for the Chinese. The Chinese want four nines. Uh, in other words, 99.99% gold. And so to take a good delivery bar, you actually have to refine it further to get a higher purity and also convert it from the 400 ounce. So in effect, China is turning its back on the London Bullion Market Association and redefining what is good delivery, redefining what the world market is. And they're doing that in more ways than one. They're doing it with the Shanghai Gold Exchange, the gold contract on the Shanghai Futures Exchange, their own refineries, their own stamps, their own specifications, you know, their own voracious. China is really uh, becoming the center of the world gold market and leaving London behind. So that was all, um, you know, a lot of this stuff is out there and you hear it in blogs and you hear tidbits here and there, but nothing like hearing it straight from the horse's mouth, nothing like hearing it in detail from, uh, from authoritative sources. And so that was very valuable as well. So the trip as a whole, as I say, uh, you know, getting out from behind your desk and behind and from in front of the screen and kicking the tires and meeting with experts with first-hand knowledge was a very, very fruitful trip. But uh, from the point of view of the um, physical gold fund, it was, of course, comforting and reassuring to see that they're dealing with the best quality, most reputable vendors uh, in the world. Well, when you gather together all this field of observation from your daily studies, sitting there at your computer, but also as you make these adventures and journeys out to meet people, to visit facilities, as you gather all this together, do you have any end of year thoughts that you'd like to share with our listeners before we close today? Yes, really too, John. The, the first one is kind of going back to our discussion about why you own gold. I gave a, a long case about how it's robust to inflation and deflation. But there's, there's a third reason, and I think this is, a, you know, couldn't be more important. Gold provides insurance to the rest of your portfolio. I've consistently said that my advice to clients is you should own between 10 and 20% gold, 10 to 20% of your investable assets, 10% for the conservative investor, 20% for the more aggressive investor, and maybe you're somewhere in between at 12 or 15, but that's, that's the right amount. And one question I get back frequently is, well, Jim, if, um, if you think gold is going a lot higher, and, and indeed I do, why not more? Why not 50% or 100%? And my answer is that, first of all, it, it may take a while to get there. There may be a lot of volatility in the meantime, and it's really unnecessary because there are other asset classes that will give you the same protection as gold, including fine art and others. But, but that said, think of 10% gold as your insurance policy. Now, imagine that instead of gold, you own a house. And I say to you, you know, do you own a house? And you say, yes. And I say, do you have uh, insurance on your house? Uh, and you say, yes, of course I do. And I say, do you want your house to burn down? And you go, no, of course not. I don't want my house to burn down. So I say, well, why do you have the insurance? If you don't want your house to burn down, why do you have the insurance? Aren't you just wasting that premium? And the answer, of course, is I don't want my house to burn down, but it might. And if it does, I want to be protected. And that's the way to think about gold in the portfolio. You don't want your portfolio to be destroyed. You don't want the stock market to crash. You don't want the bond market to crash. But they might, exactly the way your house might burn down. And so what's your insurance policy if that happens? Gold is your insurance policy. That's the world where it could go up 
by multiples and give you protection, wealth protection against the loss in the rest of your portfolio. So that's that, that's one thought I would leave investors with. The second one is for, for 2014, uh, quite a bit of talk about tapering, and the conventional wisdom is that tapering is bad for gold because it represents a form of tightening uh, that would increase real rates, and we spoke earlier about how negative real rates are good for gold. Uh, positive real rates are, that's a less good environment for gold. So isn't that a reason to sell gold? And my answer is no, because what, what it will reveal is that the Fed policies have failed. If they have to taper, but then they have to do something else, they have to reverse course or go to QE4, or there's a technical uh, so-called system repo operation that they would do to print money, even in the world of tapering. We don't need to get too in the weeds on that. But suffice to say, the Fed has a lot of ways to, to ease, even when they taper. Those will all be admissions of failure. And I think investors will look at that and say, you know what? It's been a long road, five years of money printing. It hasn't worked. This is a very scary, very dangerous world. I better get some gold just to perform this insurance function that we just talked about. That's bullish for gold. But there's another thing going on that I think is independent of tapering, uh, which is the gold market is set up for a technical rally independent of what the Fed does, just because of the declining floating supply. You know, if uh, if a short squeeze were going to happen or someone were going to corner the market, when you do that, you don't need to buy up all the gold in the world. You just need to buy up the floating supply. In other words, the gold in Fort Knox, it may be leased, but it's not being sold anytime soon. Likewise, gold around the world, the, the Chinese are buying gold. That's not going to see the light of day for 300 years. They're putting that in deep storage. That gold is, once it gets to China, it's not coming back out again. The Chinese are not day traders. The Chinese are not flippers. They're buying enormous amounts of gold. They're putting it in storage. It will never see the light of the day. So that's reducing the floating supply. So you have a larger and larger paper short based on a smaller and smaller amount of physical gold. Now, I understand it can be leveraged quite high, but there's a limit. And if you have a failure to deliver or you have an unexpected demand for delivery or the floating supply gets even smaller or there's some kind of panic buying, some catalyst, the shorts are going to find out very quickly that they can't get the gold. That's not a question of price. It's simply not available. And we see one of the big drivers in 2013 that drove the price of gold down uh, and kept it from going up is that GLD, the ETF, disgorged over 500 tons of gold. Well, that's a lot of gold to put on the market and to put downward pressure on prices. But the thing is, you can't do that twice, meaning there's only about 800 tons of gold left in GLD, and the composition of the GLD owners has gradually, the weak hands sell or ask for redemptions, and the strong hands hold. So as you go through time, you get progressively stronger hands. If I mean, if GLD were to disgorge 500 tons this year, there'd be nothing left of GLD. So I don't expect that to happen. And I think we have what happened in 2014 is something that cannot be repeated because all the gold, or at least as a practical matter, most of the gold is coming out of the ETS, has already come out, so it can't happen twice. So combine the shortage of floating supply because of Chinese acquisitions with the fact that we won't be dumping more gold because the GLD and the other ETS have greatly reduced their inventories. That's a technical setup for a major rallying gold. So I would keep an eye on that. Well, thank you, Jim Rickards. We really appreciate having you with us thank today. Thank you, John. And thank you to our listeners. Uh, you'll be excited to know that Jim's new book will be released in April 2014. It's called The Death of Money, The Coming Collapse of the International Monetary System. And it's actually available for pre-order right now at Amazon.com. So goodbye for now, and we look forward to joining you again soon.